Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for the third in our series of uh, virtual workshops from the Local News Field Guide created by Chalkbeat and in partnership with the Google News Initiative. This field guide provides practical advice for newsroom leaders and entrepreneurs. So if that's you, please check out the full guide, which will be linked into the chat. Today, we're here to talk about the strategic planning process. Uh, so first, let's do some intros. So I'm Allison Goh, Chief Strategy Officer at Chalkbeat, and I'm joined by Lance Noble, CEO and co-founder at Cityside, and Stephen George, President of Louisville Public Media. And we'll be dropping full bios also into the chat, so check those out. Um, next, a bunch of programming notes, so apologies before we get to the good stuff. One, please use the chat to introduce yourselves and tell us where you're at in your own strategic planning process. Two, we'll be running audience polls as we go to take the temperature of the room, so please participate in those so we can tailor the conversation to you. And three, we do have time at the end of the event for questions, so please drop them in the chat or the Q&A panel at any time in the event. And I promise we'll see them all and answer the ones we can get to before we wrap up. All right, let's get to it. Um, first, let's do a little bit of strategic planning 101. What is a strategic plan? I feel like you could ask this question to Google endlessly and get a billion answers. Um, now, most of you probably understand a strategic plan as a thing, a funder, or someone very important asked for. And that's, that's all you know, right? And that is a very common origin story for a strategic plan to be asked for one um, by an important person. Uh, but my personal definition of a strategic plan is that it's a document that outlines your organization's goal, hopefully an audacious one, and it outlines your unique path you've chosen to get there. And yes, the audience for this uh, strategic plan is funders and board members, but it's also for the staff for potential future staff, for your readers, and for your community. Now, I want to jump into this discussion. This is the good stuff. Um, and to do this, we first wanted to start with what we thought it would be useful, um, what, what's useful, and what makes a good strategic plan. So the first tip we have here on what makes a good strategic plan from a content point of view is to question con conventional wisdom. Okay, so my personal observation with strategic plans is that they are often a bit boring, just to be perfectly blunt. Uh, really good plans have a big, bold goal at its heart. Uh, and for Chalkbeat, for instance, that was to double in size and double more than double in geographic scope. So that's a big plan for us. Um, next, I also tend to think that excellent strategic plans outline the special way that you're going to get there. So it's really about uniqueness, right? Why will your way work when others have faltered? And if you do this right, your plan is going to be not boring, but a little bit spicy. That's, that's the official word here. Uh, for Chalkbeat, that meant doubling down on the idea of single subject local news, which is pretty unique uh, in the market, and also doubling down on philanthropy as our main revenue source even though everyone else wanted us to switch to some sort of ad-based or membership-based business. Um, so for us, it was really saying, you know, no, that's not what we're doing. We are really gonna rely on philanthropy and here's why. Now, I wanna stop talking uh, and I want to turn the mic over to Steven and then Lance to talk about the big goals in their plan uh, and the unexpected directions their plans took. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Steven first. Sure. Thank you, Allison. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining today. Um, just a really quick overview. Uh, so Louisville Public Media, we have three public radio stations, a news station, a music station, and a classical station. We also operate um, and created the Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting. So we have a large, at this point, pretty large local journalism shot by 28 reporters and editors and hosts and producers, um, all who go into making the local journalism product. It wasn't always that way. Um, about four years ago, we started working on a new strategic plan um, where we set out to uh, become a, uh, a go-to source of local news for people in the community, right? Um, what does that mean? I don't really know. Um, and the metrics we attached to it were output metrics, right? We want to grow so we can do more things, right? Um, so our big audacious goal was to position ourselves we were, we were at this point a pretty traditional public radio organization, right? Pretty audio focused, a little bit slow on the digital side, 
um, et cetera. And, um, and, you know, things like newsletter products, uh, podcasts, um, were not that sort of urgent daily must read or must listen. Um, so we set that as a big goal. And one of the sort of ways we questioned conventional wisdom internally was, um, you know, should we continue to pour this many resources into the radio side of the business? Right. Um, it's a really hard question to ask in a public radio organization. Right. For obvious reasons. Um, but one that's um, uh, really, really important to our future. Right. So um, what we said was, even though um, the radio is our primary driver of uh, new members, even though uh, at that time the radio had uh, more audience um, than our digital properties, uh, we said we think to be that go to news source for the people in our community, um, we need to really invest heavily in digital and we also need to um, pretty dramatically grow uh, our local news operation so that we're able to cover more things um, and uh, sort of be present in a new way and in a way that was uh, really atypical of, um, uh, of most public media organizations in cities our size. Um, Lance, why don't you jump in? And I actually have a follow-up question for you, Stephen, but I'll, I'll uh, hold it for a second. Good. <laughs> um, thanks, Allison. Uh, we're in a slightly different, or certainly we were in a slightly different situation when three years ago we were thinking about our strategy. Um, I think those of us at Cityside, and we weren't even called Cityside then, um, were skeptical about the whole idea of strategy. Um, we had founded Berkeley side in 2009 and we had built it honestly by doing everything seat of the pants. Um, no planning. When we founded it, we had absolutely no documents. We just did things and we did some things right. Um, we did some things wrong, but we learned quickly and we sort of iterated rapidly and, and found the right path. And we did pretty well. And that gave us the platform to take, you know, what Allison and, and Stephen called uh, big audacious goals. I always learned that it was big, hairy, audacious goals, BHAG. Um, and um, we, we decided we knew something about um, providing news to a city in Berkeley in that case, we wanted to do more. And certainly I think I'm sure everyone in this call realizes that the crisis in the country where local journalism has been declining or vanishing in so many places, our urge to do more was something that could be very important for communities we worked in. Um, so our goal was to launch in another city. We chose Oakland, our, our next door city. Um, and uh, you know, I think our initial skepticism about the whole notion of strategy um, kind of confronted the reality of, if we want to go from being at the time seven people in one office to being a real organization, and now we're 24 people, we have two locations, we're thinking about the next two, to actually go on that path, um, we needed to take more of a view, more of a strategic view and, and kind of follow some of the um, more concerted plan processes that Allison and Stephen have, have spoken about. Um, so you know, I think that that isn't so much questioning convention, but certainly approaching it from a slightly different direction. Now, Stephen, I'm curious, when you suggested that a public media entity should de-emphasize radio for a bit, how did that go down? Like, what were all the people's <laughs> response? Um, tepid. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, it, it's, the organization was ready in some ways, culturally, for a big jump forward. Um, but in other ways, it, it, it wasn't, right? So I mean, I'd say almost rhetorically, we were ready for a big change, right? So people think, okay, I'm ready for something new. It's time. I understand why. And then when we start to say, um, well, rather than uh, create a show for the radio, we're going to do this instead. Um, once it starts to get down into the practical, it mm -hmm. gets a lot harder for people to understand. 
um, or maybe make that change. Also, um, and this is really important, um, you have to have a lot of uh, tolerance for risk and uncertainty when you um, when you start to see the bulk of your audience um, growing online, where you know literally we have a dollars to dimes challenge, right? In terms of fundraising, we're not raising nearly as much money online as we are um, through more traditional for us traditional means. Um, so it becomes harder to make the case internally, right? Because people say, well, we kind of keep doing this. This has been successful. Um, and it, it becomes that sort of classic, almost, um, uh, you know, cursed by your own success uh, situation. Mm-hmm. So um, it is very hard um, and it takes persistence. Um, it takes simplicity. And I think we'll get into that later when we talk about the sort of how of a, of a plan. But um, y- y- you've got to be crisp and concise and think about, um, messaging internally the same way you might message and market something external. Um, yeah, and I, I think my observation is, you know, P- Louisville Public Media is a more legacy organization. It's got a lot of history, a lot of um, longtime mythology, likely. I've never worked there, but I'm assuming I have worked with companies. Uh, and even, but even a place like Chalkbeat is newer and, and Cityside is newer. But, you know, you're surrounded by people who have an idea of how things uh, what w- will work, should work. And I think when the, my hypothesis of why strategic plans get boring is that you start listening to too many people and you try to put everything you heard that people think is a good idea into one place. But what it does, it dilutes all the ideas. Um, and I remember doing our plan and we had like, we're going to like increase philanthropy by 50% and also uh, earned revenue or sponsorships so it's going to grow 10,000% or something and be half of our revenue, but also, you know, our jobs board was going to be amazing. And I just went to our CEO. I was like, I don't actually think any of these things are going to happen. And I don't see how we can believably put these down on paper when we've never shown we've been able to do more than like, you know, just shy of a million. We're a bit bigger, but like, you know, we, I don't see how we're going to hit like 10 million in revenue on sponsorships in five years. Like, it's just like, there's no plan for that. Uh, and that's when you have to, but like everyone kept saying, what's your plan to grow earned revenue? And I kept, I just realized I like, this is a red herring question and we should reject the premise of the question, right? And, and that's the part that starts feeling spicy, right? When you're, you're effectively rejecting the premise of the question, you do it nicer than, you know, what I'm saying right now, but with the stakeholders who are suggesting it. But if you're not making like a controversial statement like that in some way, I, I suspect that your plan is becoming, you know, less, less useful um, because when, push comes to shove and you're saying, should we fund the new radio program or a new audience team? Uh, the plan should tell you what you should do. And if it doesn't tell you what you should do, like it's not a good plan probably, or it's like you've written it to be too, a little too vague or, uh, you know, uh, serving too many audiences, I suppose. But, but Allison, don't you think there are kind of, there are two different pressures that I think Lendi, you, you say most plans are boring. I, I think the two pressures are there's one pressure like your, you know, original draft with the 10,000% growth and things like that, where it, it's just nonsensical and you know, <laughs> people say, oh, we need to think big. And, and so people throw in elements that have no grounding in reality. Um, and so that may not be boring, but it probably won't be very useful. I think the other tendency is um, we want something that, is achievable and comprehensible and isn't going to rock the boat too much. And that way is the way of boredom. And it's also, I think all of us, you know, confronting the reality that, you know, it's really hard. It's impossible, in fact, to figure out what the future will bring. Very vivid for us. You know, we were doing all this planning in 2019, early 2020. And we all know what happened in March 2020, which, you know, we tore up all of our plans and, you know, reconfigured to, you know, certainly concentrate for a few months on our main task, doing journalism about this crisis of the pandemic. And, you know, our plans about when we were going to do things just confronted reality. Um, And I think, you know, worrying about what might happen probably forces people towards conformity and boredom is, is part of it. I think it's just, it's, 
it's maybe less boredom and it's just, it's, it's not memorable, right? I mean, I think it's important to make a strategic plan memorable. And I, uh, if you're trying to affect change within your organization or with your, your board or certainly with uh, a potential funder. Um, and I think for us, it, you know, the, the, um, one of the big things uh, for me about strategic planning is you have to do what's right for you in that moment. Um, and for us three plus years ago, um, <clears throat> it was uh, right in the moment for us to do a very prescriptive strategic plan. This, the plan that we're just ending right now, we're just finishing it, um, is very long. <clears throat> it is very detailed. It has budget lines. It's a roadmap to growth. Um, and we followed it even um, through the pandemic, uh, frankly, especially through the pandemic. Um, and we, we achieved virtually everything we set out to achieve over that period of time. We had to do that in that way. Um, I think from a cultural perspective to get people to buy in, right. To show them if this, then that, if this, then that, um, and we're taking a very different approach now. I think we'll maybe get to that later, but, um, it's cause we're in a different moment. I, I don't know if this intrudes on, we'll get to this later, but Stephen, in, in the green room discussion, I think you, you told Allison and me that your plan, whatever it was three years ago, was a certain length, and now you're aiming for something very different. That might be interesting for people. <laughs> I think it was, Allison, go ahead. I don't want to step on Yeah, no, no, I, I was... Um... I was just thinking, I just had a separate thought about, um, Stephen, what you said about memorable. Um, and then I'm, I'm somehow multitasking and I just saw a comment like, what's an example of memorable and doable? And it actually gets to the second thing that um, I think makes a really good strategic plan is like, yes, it's memorable. But as Lance, you were saying, it can't be crazy or like it can be memorable because it's crazy. Um, but you, the, the part that's memorable, but then is doable is I think if you support your spicy claims with data, it becomes memorable and doable, right? So right. Uh, I, I would love to talk about data and, and, and you know testimonials a bit because I think that is actually another very important part of the strategic plan. So yes, you cannot just say crazy stuff that gets people's attention and not support it with some evidence that you can actually do it. So I'll, the example I, I give here is at Chalkbeat, you know, we said we're doubling down on philanthropy and we're doing it because we're good at it. We realize, you know, like to date, eight years into our existence, most of our money comes from philanthropy. Why would we say our strategic plan is that it's going to flip 80, 20 the other direction when we have no evidence that we could do that? But we do have a lot of evidence that our philanthropy dollars were um, strong. And the, the con conventional wisdom actually with philanthropy is that it doesn't renew. Like you get a grant and then it goes away after three years and then you're like, like you're kind of shit out of luck, right? But what we found is we, when we actually looked at our grants, and so we had someone actually go through our database and see, okay, when, we, when the grant ends, does it renew? And we found that 72% of our gifts in that, the past couple of years renewed. That's a very high renewal rate. And, and we had many years to kind of back up that that probably would continue when we had the right processes in place to, to get people to be really um, loyal to us. And so um, we were able to look at our own data and, and prove, and so that's in the strategic plan too, is like, yes, we're doubling down on philanthropy. And also, by the way, we're good at it. We're damn good at it. Uh, and so that makes it doable, right? Um, that, 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 that direction makes sense for us. And if I had tried to say, we're going to blow sponsorships out of the water, but then I'm like, and but we've only raised like this, we've only like ever raised this much in our history, it makes no sense. And it is crazy and memorable in a bad way. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have some examples of that, of kind of going through your own, pulling your own data and your own experiences to prove like why your direction is the right direction. Um, I'm, I'm happy to leap in. Um, I think a good example is, you know, we, you know, we decided we would launch in Oakland. We created Oakland side, launched in June of 2020. Um, we'd been operating a new site in the neighboring city, Berkeley for, 10 years at the time, we knew Oakland pretty well. Um, but actually, you know, we went into this in a you know, very humble way. We did not assume that what had worked in Berkeley would work in Oakland, that we knew Oakland, you know, well enough to do the right thing. And so we really engaged in a, a very extensive community listening and information needs assessment project that took, 
you know, four to six months. Um, and I think through that, we compiled about 1,400 pieces of what we call data. I mean, some of it might be data by the conventional thing. A lot of it was, you know, we spoke to this person and we spoke to people individually. We did group things. We tabled at summer festivals. We did a whole bunch of different ways to reach people. Um, but we captured and, um, you know, indexed and eventually analyzed and synthesized that 1300, 1400 different pieces of data. And from that, we derived what we call our founding values, which has been very, very important for the growth of Oakland side. And um, so that data was was absolutely crucial. I, I completely consider that. I mean, I know like data people will say that's not data, but it's it's yeah evidence. I think is what it's not so much about data, but like have you do you have compelling evidence that your your spicy hypothesis is going to work out? Uh, and I think that's it's partially data and like you know. Uh, in the traditional sense, but also testimonials and real life stories, especially journalism is a storytelling, <laughs> an exercise in storytelling. So this makes sense. Um, Stephen, what about you? I, I know that you mentioned something uh, in a previous conversation. Um, yeah, so we did, um, in, in ter I, think, I think you have to have a balance like you all are saying of data and instinct um, and you know, one of the first things we did in our strategic plan was um, actually conduct a, um, a market survey to figure out what, what our sort of headroom was in terms of audience around local news and around our music stations. Um, and what that, what that did was basically confirm our hypothesis right out of the gate that um, the way for us to grow both in terms of overall revenue for the entire organization and audience was local news by investing um, a lot deeper in local news. And so that sort of propelled us uh, forward. We used a lot of um, internal data um, as well. Um, and we, like Lance said, we conducted a whole lot of community interviews and things like that. And we went through a process there too. I do think, you you know, particularly for the leader or the leadership team, um, <clears throat> you have to be really firm and committed to kind of your core ideas. Um, you know, one of the one of the the discussions we often have uh, with our board, and I just had it with our executive committee yesterday, talking about a new strategic plan, is, um, you know, how much do you want beyond the scope of what journalism does? How much do you want to commit to try to do? Right? Like, as an organization, are we are we going to change the world, or are we going to do media in a better, more equitable way? Right? Um, and let that maybe go where it does. Um, are we going to try to make life better for people or are we going to try to compel and inspire and cajole people to make life better for others, right? It's a, it's sort of a complicated thing, but I think you have to really show some restraint in these kinds of processes as well, or else it really gets like Allison, you were saying earlier, like it really gets out of, you're like, yeah, let's do that. Let's do this too. Let's do that. And, you know, um, it's easy in those settings to, um, to, to run wild. The, um, one, I think we can move that we have like a, we thought through like, okay, another part of this conversation would be that the how to put the plan together yeah. as much as the what's in it. Um, and I think this is a really great segue. And also I, I believe someone asked a related question about this, which is um, the, when we, when we did our process of putting the plan together, I called um, our approach cautiously collaborative. Um, and so the collaborative part is speaking to what Lance and Steven are talking about the listening tour, um, which includes your community members, but we also talk to our existing funders and potential future funders and stakeholders, like people who just care um, and are connected. And we did that because I think it is important to get a very broad perspective on what you're doing and what's going on kind of at a high level, you know, the clouds, but also what's going on the ground. So that's the collaborative part. But I, but actually the, what I, what I'm more interested in discussing is the cautious <laughs> cautious part of cautiously collaborative. And um, one thing we were discussing is like, you can get overwhelmed by these voices that you're asking, you're asking for their opinion, but then you're like, oh my God, there's so many opinions. Uh, they contradict each other. Um, if you're doing it right, they're contradicting each other uh, and you can't possibly say you're gonna do one thing and the other, they literally are mutually exclusive. And um, I think a very important thing to build in, build in uh, something that was important for us was to make sure at the end of the day, there was 
one or two authors of the strategic plan and that they were like really editing and creating the vision for what you were doing. And so at Chalkbeat, that was me as the chief strategy officer and the CEO. So like very high level people, like this is not like a mid-level person's job. Um, and we, I, and like some places and use an external person who's like a professional strategy person and who, who knows how to pull out the best ideas out of all of that conversation. Uh, we didn't use an external consultant. I, I kind of played that role. Um, I, I also didn't exactly know how to do it, but like, I was just like, we're gonna, we, but we're gonna, I know that we needed to have a, like a very singular vision. And, but I know uh, Stephen and Lance, you've used external help in varying forms. And I think someone had a question about what it's like uh, with an external type consultant. So uh, Lance, do you wanna jump in on your experience with that and how, how you use that resource to also kind of hone what you were trying to say? Yeah, I, I think in our case, it was very helpful because, because, you know, as I said, we were a handful of people. We were still obviously running Berkeley side at the time. The amount of time any of us could devote to really stepping back and you know, getting that that wider vision um, was was limited. And we were fortunate uh, through a, a mutual friend we were introduced to. Um, Steve Sachs, he'd been the chairman of Texas Tribune, which, uh, you know, I think for most of us doing what we do is, you know, one of the organizations we we look to as a model. Um, and he had, you know, a lot of uh, other highly relevant experience and just a, an all around good guy. So we worked pretty intensively with Steve as a sort of leadership team working with him to, you um, you know, build up this this strategy and this vision. Um, I think it's important to say, and I saw there was a question, um, strategic plan sounds like, oh, there is, there is definitely something big and, you know, audacious and concrete that's gonna come out of it. I think you need to scale it for where you are in your um, life cycle of an organization. You, somebody put in a question, we're just starting out, you know, I think when you're just starting out, you probably need to put in some work with whoever you're, you know, you're doing this with to figure out what's your North star, where are you aiming? I'd be a little worried if you did much more than that, because there's so much you need to just do and just get going. And, you know, at some point then, you know, you, it'll be great to take a breath and figure out, are we on track? How do we stay on track? All that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, I, I'd be pretty skeptical about a complex process because you will be in the mire of analysis paralysis. And you'll probably never get anywhere. Um, if you're a more mature organization, if you have some spare resources, you can do more. Um, you know, if you've been around for a long time, you know, you can kind of have a set of gradations as to what you can really accomplish depending on your, um, you know, whether you're in your infancy or your maturity or going through some significant change. Um, don't think of this as, oh, everybody's gonna have a similar kind of product at the end. Yeah, I think um, early stage, it, it's still worthwhile writing down what your goal, what's your, what's your mission or vision of what, why you should yeah. exist, what makes you special, and what are your like three big bets early on yeah. And that should be like one or two pages if yeah. you're like truly a startup. Yeah. But it is worth it to write it down, in my opinion, and and do the interview. Like you should do maybe if Chalkbeat we did 50 interviews, maybe as a startup you do 20. Um, but like the opposite is also not suggested, right? <laughs> like do nothing and just like go out there and try random stuff. Like I mean, you can do that; it works for some people. But yeah, and you know, I think I think your point, Allison, about write it down, even if it's one page. I think that's important because everyone needs to be kind of heading the same way. And if you can actually express that and make that explicit, that makes that easier. If you think, oh, all of us have a notion of where we're going and that isn't explicit, you may actually find that all of you don't have the same notion of where you're going. So um, I think that's that's very wise counsel. And the bigger you are, the the harder it is the or maybe the quicker it gets out of hand you have to have a decision making rubric and 
um, that should be the simple and memorable thing, right? Our, our strategic plan was like 30 pages, but I could put our mission, vision, values, and goals on one, right? And they're easy to talk about. They're in sort of human language, um, right? Be a, be a go-to trusted local news source for people who want in-depth and investigative reporting about the community, right? Um, and then the, how you get there is 20 budget lines and all the other stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing I do is I created, uh, speaking of like a decision-making rubric, I gave, um, I use a very simple Venn diagram that everybody in the company has. Um, and I repeat it often, and it just is um, mission, audience, sustainability. And if you have an idea, find that sweet spot in the middle, right? And and um, and go from there. Does it hit the mission? Does it do something for our? Is a value add for our current audience, or is it getting us into new places? Um, and have you thought about how to make it sustainable? Um, uh, and that what that's done is clarified the creative process internally. Um, and also force people to talk across teams and silos, right? So um, editorial leadership who wants to do a new podcast, they have to talk to sales and figure out, is this a, is this a sellable idea? Is this a sponsorable thing? You know, on and on, right? So it, um, it's a very simple and, again, very memorable thing um, that's easy, uh, but also, uh, I think, drives uh, better judgment and decision making. I love that. I've cribbed it. I've got it in my notebook. <laughs> Um, things you wish you knew before you, at the start of having a facilitator or a consultant, that was, that's a question here. Anything, words of wisdom? Less pressure. Like we, so we use a facilitator three, four years ago. Um, and we're not right now. I'm running the process. I wrote the plan last time after the facilitator delivered like a full on huge report. Um, and I just to reiterate something earlier. I think it's that Allison said, I think it's really important that your CEO or your top people are writing it. Um, yes. You know, um, I put an enormous amount of pressure on myself. Uh, I think as we were going into that, the first process um, with the facilitator and, um, you know, the, the facilitator being present relieved some of that, um, which was nice, right? So as the CEO, I'm able to like sit and sort of observe and think and, and respond and not have to sort of manage the process as well. So depending on how you like to work, I'd say, you know, find something that's suitable for you, that suits you and your style and find somebody that, uh, and a process that um, also does the same for your board. Um, you know, now we're just in a much stronger, better position to be able to have a less prescriptive, more directional strategic plan. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the board and I are in, um, pretty tight alignment on the direction of the organization. So um, it felt like this time around, um, it, you know, it should be a much different process. Yeah, I, that makes a lot of sense. I think the other thing that's important to say is um, a consultant or a facilitator shouldn't, and I think can't make decisions for you. Um, right. That person is there, or if it's an organization, they're there to help you with the process, to maybe guide you to add resource, but uh, the decisions need to be made by you. Um, and you know, the thing about paying someone is you can reject their advice. Um, you know, you shouldn't feel, oh my gosh, we've you know, hired this Oracle and, and you know, we need to obey the Oracle. Don't get into that situation. Yeah, I would, um... The way I would, someone else asked, like, do you have any tips on going through this process without much organizational capacity, staff or budget? Um, when we can't, we probably can't manage an outside facilitator or invest a huge amount of time with our current staff capacity. So this is rela related to this, but one, I'm just going to repeat a third time, that the facilitator, any outside consultant isn't the person that's going to actually make your plan spicy. That's going to be the CEO, okay? Because, like, it's got to come from like the heart and soul of the organization and an external consultant's not going to give that to you. What a consultant can do is like interviewing people is a lot of time. Uh, and even just organizing the meetings to do these is a lot of time. And a CEO or executive team like literally does not have time to schedule these meetings. And so a facilitator can actually do the interviews on your behalf or some of them. Um, sometimes it's good to have a th third party, like if it's like a 
you know, low level or entry level employees like super scared. If Stephen is super intimidating and doesn't want to say the truth, you maybe have a facilitator help out and you know get people to be more open. Um, but they are going to put together information, and it's still the executive team's responsibility to interpret that and um, move forward with the plan. But um, it's hard for me to imagine. This is a lot of work. There's just no world where it's not a lot of work for the CEO or whoever is drafting this thing. And the interviews have to happen. You know, it's if you don't do the version of this where there's like a, some amount of work that it feels like, well, that was a lot, then you're probably not actually doing a very good strategic plan. So I just don't know how to, this question is hard because I don't think you can really have a good output unless you've really like said that this is an important priority to do. Um, and you're going to get something that's pretty milk toast if you don't put that time in. So I, I don't, it's like a, it's like a it's eternal problem here. Um, it's possible to get funding for just strategic planning. It's called capacity building. So if you're in the nonprofit world, that is an option. A lot of people like to fund things that are like one-time investments. So you might be able to find somebody to give you like a 10 or 20 or $30,000 grant one time to hire a facilitator that might help. And that is a real thing out in the world. Um, but it's a little chicken egg because you got to convince someone that you have a plan worth investing in without having the plan. So I don't know. Um, but it's the thing. Uh, okay. That's one question. I, I don't know if you guys wanted to add anything else, but I thought um, that was a common question. Okay. So the eternal question about the board, I think there is, how did you work with your boards on your plans and when did you bring them in? Um, I have a 24 person board. Um, <laughs> we were talking about this before <laughs> and I was a little bit, uh, uh, I'm the outlier in this group with a board that size. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's really great to have a board that size for a lot of reasons. And it's challenging for a lot that you probably can imagine too. Um, when it comes to strategic planning, um, you have to have your board chair aligned with you. Um, I'd start with your executive committee if you're structured that way. Um, right. Which is a smaller sort of more, uh, theoretically at least more, uh, influential, um, uh, group on your board, um, bring them in at the beginning. Um, like, right. I mean, before you start, right. I'm thinking here's, we need a strategic plan. We were working on it. I was thinking maybe we do it this way. What do you think? Right. I mean, um, I think you need to make it really open. Um, and then the other thing you have to do with your board during a strategic planning process is say no, um, which is hard, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, your board members uh, all coming from uh, likely uh, the right place will introduce some ideas um, that will uh, that could pull your focus away um, or uh, or may just not comport exactly with what you know to be um, your operations. So, I, I, you know, I think you have to have the board in from the beginning. Certainly, you don't want to surprise anybody on the board with anything you're doing. Um, but you ought to have, you need to have that sort of clarity of mission um, and, and uh, at the outset. And um, uh, I would assume that anybody who's already on your board um, is aligned with, with, with that mission um, already. So um, my yeah, sense. I, I concur early. Yeah. Early and all often. the time. Um, that's literally <laughs> yeah. there to help you strategically. Like that's, yeah board um and you should have board members who are strategic in nature yeah. sometimes that doesn't happen but <laughs> that's the that's what you should hope for um yeah. let's, let's, ellen and lance if you wanted to add but uh, there's one more question i think we can squeeze in and then yeah no my confidence in steven's ability to manage a 24 person board has soared because that was a model answer <laughs> <laughs> if you can if you can manage Thank you, lance. a 24 person board you can do anything um <laughs> Okay, so then this is a really quick question maybe. Uh, is there an industry standard or best practice for the number of years in a strategic plan? One, three, five, and 10. What does that depend on? Any hot takes here? You may know more about the industry standard, Allison. I think you've gotten more deeply into this process. I, I'd reemphasize my point of earlier that I think even if there is an industry standard, um, your where you are in your life cycle at an org, at an organization is going to influence that greatly. If you're at the absolute start, like you haven't done anything, you just have an idea. 
maybe thinking three or five years out, sorry about my dog barking in the background here, um, is, uh, is fine in some loose way. If you try and get much more uh, granular than that, you're kidding yourselves. You don't know what one year is going to bring. And, you know, looking three years out is nearly impossible. If, if you've got a track record of over the last several years, we've done this and we know what steady state looks like, those, you know, looking three years becomes a little more plausible. Um, so, you know, I, I think judge that by your organizational needs. Yeah. Steven? I, total, I totally agree. Um, we did three years because we had that track record and we had really predictable um, income streams that sort of formed the foundation of uh, the revenue side of our plan. Um, you know, I, I, I would say also, I'll give you an example, um, and this kind of crosses over this question and the board question. Um, about six months ago, I went to um, my uh, board and said, you know, based on our experience over the last three years and, and what COVID did to everything and where we think the economy might be going right now, I would, I would um, urge us to do a one-year plan rather than a three. Um, and they, after a lot of discussion, kind of said, eh, eh, we'd like to do a three-year plan. So, <laughs> you know, you got to be willing to um, to give a little bit to, um, uh, particularly when you're managing a, a, a larger board. Um, but uh, I think the outcome has been tremendous. Um, I'm very confident in the sort of outlines of our upcoming three year plan and the strategic pillars we're building and all that. So, I, you know, yeah. um, I think they were right. Um, I think my answer, I do think the more immature is, of an organization you are, the more likely it's going to be shorter time frame because so much can change and how fast you're moving. My other insight to this is that there's a difference between the horizon that you're envisioning, which can be longer, like say five years, but the plan, like the bit bets probably don't last longer than two or three years. Um, right. because, so like you can think about like, what are we going to look like in five years, but your plan has only has a level of detail for the first couple of years. Cause like literally no one who knows what they're doing will believe anything past the three years. Cause like yes. no one can predict. I mean, we, I li we literally published our strategic plan in 2019 and then the pandemic happened and we're just like, wow. <laughs> uh, and I'm very impressed that you guys stuck to your plan. Cause ours like kind of, we like half stuck to it. And we're like, what do you do? Um, and, but one year feels short unless you're a really scrappy startup, I have to say, um, mostly because it takes more than a year to get many things going. Uh, but once again, it's kind of like the velocity you're working at can make a difference here. So startups tend to be doing more, all, trying many things faster. Uh, but a more mature organization is not going to get very much done in a year. It just takes a year to do the culture change part, right? If, if not more. I mean, at least. Yeah. At least. So, like it's taken me four. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will say one, like one thing to add there. We did. We we stuck to most of our plan. Um, you know, we didn't stick to the part of our plan that included um, building a whole uh, events business. <laughs> um, and I think the reason I raised that we had purchased um, a uh, an online like calendar service and we were building a whole vertical around it um, both in sort of content and event execution and um, you know we had it had a solid five figure budget line with it revenue line with it um, and it evaporated when the pandemic hit and we just shut it down and said all right this is not our business and this is not going to work and it's not going to work for a long time um, and it's not our core competency. And so I, my point is, even if you commit to a three-year plan, you have to have the courage to say, this is not working. We need to just cut it Yeah. when it's not working. Um, amazing. Okay. So we're over time. <laughs> this is a really fun discussion. Um, this is a really good crew. So I appreciate, um, the time you guys, everyone is spending with us and really good question. So a um, couple closing programming notes here, of course. Um, so I mentioned this is the third in a series. And so we have our fourth and last event in this series scheduled for the week after election day. So November 16th. And that one is about philanthropic fundraising. So please join Amy Rosenblum, Chalkbeat's chief revenue officer and Ebony Rose Thompson, a portfolio manager at the Schusterman Foundation. Uh, as they decompose the myths and misconceptions around philanthropic funding. Uh, I personally think this is going to be a very interesting discussion because you get to hear 
about philanthropy from inside a foundation uh, from a program officer herself. So I think that's just very interesting and a, a rare opportunity. Uh, we'll be putting that link uh, in the chat, like all things are in the chat right now. And, and I think we'll send um, an email to the folks who RSVP'd here. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate the very thoughtful questions and participation of the folks in the audience. And of course, thanks to Lance and Stephen for being so open about their processes and giving such great advice. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.